Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Jewish Teen Talk, episode 30. Everybody. So uh, we're going to start with one question. Uh, we're going to try to get to questions from August. We still have a few questions, but um, recently questions have come in both as responses to our episodes on Spotify, as well as questions that were emailed uh, and, and written uh, through the website. And the first question is, if you can please talk about psychological warfare. That was a response to an episode on uh, Spotify, one of the episodes that we spoke a little bit about the war. So it must have been either this past episode or the one before. Yeah. And because these sensitive, the sorry, these questions are time sensitive, we're going to address them first and then we'll get to the questions that have come in. Right. So psychological warfare means warfare is the idea of um, hurting people physically. And psychological warfare is the idea of hurting people mentally. Um, and part, a big part of the war that terrorists in general, and Hamas in particular, Hamas, ISIS um, in particular, what they try to do is they try to break our spirits. Um, and so one of the ways that they do that, recently they sent a video to a parent of one of the people who, who was kidnapped and they sent a video of this person talking and they showed a picture of her after she had passed away. So they wanted to break the spirits of the people um, who had been... Uh, who are hostages. Who are hostages and, and the families of the hostages. So I, I just want to make it clear that um, what we know now is that the people and I don't even want to call them people, who came in, these animals who came in Ter to to um, do these type of things to our brothers and sisters, uh, they needed to take certain drugs. Um, the, the, I, I can tell you the name of the drug, uh, but we know that they took certain drugs that turned off their ability to feel because feeling, caring people cannot do the types of things that these animals did um, and uh, you know I think it's very important especially nowadays when the world is a topsy-turvy world where dark is light and light is dark nothing is as it seems and when we read in the news and people talk about proportion and they talk about um, you know uh, uh, you know, we need to we need to respond in a humanitarian way. Just know that the Torah says that if someone comes to hurt you, we need to go and defend ourselves. And there's no so, sort of thing of proportion in 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 um, when it comes to war. And this is really a war, and it's not just a war against our brothers and sisters, our family in Eretz Yisrael. It's a war against Yiddishkeit and people who are good and kind um, and stand up for the right thing and believe in Hashem all over the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I realize that's that's happening is that it's like repeating history over yeah. and over again. Like if we think of, um, even on the Holocaust, they tried to break, not just to break, you know, as, as our bodies, but also to break us as Jews, you know, where we're running away from being proud of being Jewish and right. we're and we're afraid that if we're Jewish, we're going to be targeted. Um, the same thing in um, the times of the Hanukkah, which is coming right. up. They didn't only want to kill the Yidin, but if, if what was more important to them was to destroy our, our morale our mor morale, morale, yeah. morale, and our belief in Hashem, and we weren't allowed to do this. We weren't allowed to practice that. So, and that was a physical war that we learn about. But when we talk about psychological war, it's really how we think of ourselves, how we, um, the fears that are created from seeing whether you know someone's on TikTok, someone's on. Instagram, YouTube, it's all over now. And if people are watching these horrific videos and they are being affected by it and we're subjecting ourselves to that terror, right. then that then they win because mm. what they want to do is they want to spread 
terror and they want the terror to um, penetrate right into our hearts into our minds into our lives uh, into our lives and that is psychological warfare it affects us psychologically not only physically um, or spiritually but psychologically we start to um, either envision a terrible future and you right. know that's paralyzing or in the moment now we don't feel safe we don't feel secure we feel like there's threat at every moment right and that's that's what they want they want us to break they want mm. us to be terrified of them yeah and i think another piece of psychological warfare that i think bash and i and our family experiences and i'm sure a lot of other people do as well is this idea of survivor's guilt where you know we start to feel like how can i be happy how can i go through my day how can i do the things that um I usually do in my day-to-day -day life when other people are not able to experience those things. Yeah. And, you know, the the idea that there are people who are um, going about their day-to-day -day life, living as proud Yidin, being happy. We know that Simcha breaks through all boundaries. And so us being happy is especially and specifically the thing that will... Um, Counteract. Counteract this. And also happiness, it doesn't mean that you have to always have a pasted smile and you feel like dancing. Happiness mm. is really just embracing who we are and being able to accept who we are because that brings on peace and inner happiness. So not running away from being Jewish. Some people I heard are taking down their mezuzahs. They don't want to be identified as Jewish. The right. mezuzah is what's going to protect us. So be, maybe before we go on to the next question, we've spoken about the damage that psychological warfare can do. But what are practical ways that we can help ourselves if we're I falling like into the trap of going into this place of psychological warfare where we feel attacked, we feel afraid, and our mind and our heart and everything inside of us is getting affected by the news or by videos or by just the fact that there is a war. Right. So like Shua said, like one thing... Um, one thing is to be happy, so to embrace who we are. We are Jewish, and we'll always be Jewish, no matter what. And this is something that's happened in the past, and Hashem always, you know, saves us, and He will, as long as He's on our side and we rely on Him, He will be the one to redeem us and to redeem the captives. Um, you know, another way is very, very powerful, and I'm sure Shua can say a lot about this, but a lot of powerful is what's in our mind. And so I can speak personally for myself. I know that if I watch certain videos or if I follow the news, I will be paralyzed with fear. I will not be able to go teach. I won't be able to take care of my kids, right. take care of myself because it will take me, it will overtake me. So I choose to look at videos that are very, very encouraging, that show the mm. pride of Amisral, that show achtos, unity. Right. And those videos, and also I try to arrange... Um, support in the sense of like let's sing together let's unite let's do good things together because that is the only way to counteract um what they're trying to accomplish right and i think something that's very important this ties into the next question the next question is the world is doing so much kindness during these days and mashiach could have came how do we know mashiach is actually coming and this person wrote this question has been bugging me ever since the war started and so I'll, I'll tell this questioner that it's not only you that this question has been bugging, but all of us. And so two points I want to make. And please remind me, I wanted to talk about, um, oh shoot, did I forget already? Viktor Frankl and... Um, It'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. By the Six Day War, I'll start with the first thing, and then you remind me about Victor Frankl. By the Six Day War, I might have to remind you to remind me. Okay, I might forget. <laughs> Just remind me now. <laughs> so, um, by the Six Day War, then everybody thought that Ertisrol was was gone. You know, there wasn't, according to the rules of nature, it wasn't possible for Israel to win over all the countries that stood up against it, and. At that time, the Lubavitch Rebbe spoke to Yassel Gutnik, and he said that the time of the Six Day War was a time that was Zman Mesugal, it's called a, 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 a time that was appropriate or um, 
there was something special about that time, like a time that it was very possible for Mashiach to come then. Mm. But why was why did Mashiach not come then? The Rebbe said because people did not recognize that this was all from Hashem. They thought that it was the strength of the army of Israel, or even people who did recognize, but it wasn't mentioned, you know, from uh, from the highest levels. Um, and this war is very different. This war is um, a, a war that everybody, and we, we see nonstop, both from the sides of the soldiers and from the way that the prime minister and the, and the ministers are talking about this, and from the way that even the, the non-religious people in, in all the news stations are thanking Hashem, and, and, and uh, there's a, a recognition that this is, um, you know, a melchemas Hashem. It really is. It's a war for the sake of Hashem, for the sake of Hashem's people. And that's why, if you notice, when you look at videos of soldiers, they're all happy. They all recognize and they all are appreciate and aware that this is a holy job that they're doing. It's not something that we want to be doing. We'd rather be in a, a place of peace and not have to uh, defend ourselves. But when we defend ourselves and it's clear that it's from Hashem, then we do it with happiness. And, and so this is something that's very different about this war than other wars. Yeah. I don't want you to forget, Victor Frank. I'm going to remember. It. Okay. Go ahead. So just, I want to address also the point, because you're talking about the fact that this war and everybody's coming together, even the soldiers are hopeful, happy, like Hashem's, you know, on our side. Yeah. And I just want to bring out the idea of Mashiach, because you asked, you know, the question is centered around, we're doing so much good, everybody's mm. uni in unity, people are taking on mitzvahs, taking on good deeds, um, getting closer to Hashem, getting closer to each other, which is essentially what Hashem wants, what God wants. And so just to um, just to remind our listeners or our viewers um, what Mashiach is, if you're wondering, we did do that in a previous episode. Mashiach is a time of utopia. So a time when there will be no more wars, there will be peace in the world, there will be no more fighting, no more sickness, um, no more deaths. So it's really going to be a time when it's just going to be amazing. And it's going to be every dream that you have, everything you're asking for, everything you're hoping for is going to come true when that time comes. And so um, Mashiach is um, the anointed one. And there's prophecies that there's going to be a, a very um, righteous person who will redeem us the same way that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, in this time of Mitzrayim, he... Um, he redeemed the Jews. Hashem sent him and he saved the Jews. So this time, though, the, the difference is that this time when Mashiach comes, so um, when this person, this great um, chosen person is going to redeem everyone, it's going to be the last time that we ever have to be redeemed. Right. And that's why the question is, he, sh he should be here already, or it should have come, if we're talking about Mashiach's times, the time of utopia. Utopia is like, a absolute joy and happiness and peace or if you're talking about like Mashiach coming like where is he already so how and then how do we know that he's actually coming because if the time now seems like it's really you know there's so much kindness and we're actually the world is getting ready for this time why isn't he here yet so I just wanted to like also bring that in so that the question is being addressed and it's an excellent question. I mean, for years and years, the Jews have been asking this question, like, where is he already? Right. Um, if Hashem promised us that there's going to be a time, also we're going to have the temple again, we're going to have the Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, and it'll never be destroyed. And it's, it's going to be, everyone's going to be united. So if we're seeing all that unity happening, and the world is becoming a better place, where is he? When is yeah. that actually going to come true? So I think just to add to what you're saying, you know, um, because we've gotten questions about why should I want Mashiach to come? So just to remind you that utopia, when we're talking about that we're going to be really happy with and we're going to have what we want, what we want is going to be what Hashem wants. And that's why we're going to be so happy. That's a really important point to bring out is that it's, we're not going to be confused. Now we're confused about 
you know, why should I want certain things? Or mm -hmm. is Hashem really real? Or what's the point of all of this? Right. When Mashiach comes, all of the, that confusion is going to be a waste. When we talk about utopia, that's what we mean. Yeah, and I've heard the fear of Mashiach coming is centered around, but like, I'm not going to have what I like or what I need mm. because all of a sudden it's going to be everything Hashem wants or we're going to want to learn Torah all day. So like she was saying, even our wants and our needs that are like, you know, based on what we're comfortable with and what we're used to, whatever we want and need that's Hashem's wants and needs because we'll, we'll like experience godliness on the next level, we are going to be content, we're going to be happy, we're going to be at peace with ourselves. Right. And we're all going to, um, we're all waiting for that time. And the, I just want to like... Um, I just want to point out that the time when Mashiach comes, so in the in the Tyra, it says that either it's going to be through a big war, and that's how he's going to come. So that's kind of what we're seeing right now is a big war, the fact that like Russia and Ukraine are still at war. Now all of a sudden there's another war that's exploding. So either it's going to be there's going to be a war, and then we'll be redeemed, or if it happens before it's time, it could also, he could also come, that time can come without there having to be a war. Mm. And that's what a lot of us are praying for. Like when I light Shabbos candles now, I just ask Hashem, just bring Mashiach now. Don't cause a war for him to come. Like, please, like, let us be deserving that he's going to come already. Right. And I think that ties in to Viktor Frankl, the point <laughs> that I want go. to bring out. Because Viktor Frankl... Um, he, he started up uh, a modality of therapy called logotherapy. And logotherapy is about the idea that we can get through any difficult situation as long as we have a meaning, a meaningful... Uh, a, 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 we understand why we're going through it, we can get through this. Um, when Viktor Frankl was in the concentration camps, he was a Holocaust survivor. When he was in the concentration camps, he was in a death march, a forced labor march, and m many people, they did these forced labor marches, they took these people who were underfed, who were emotionally destroyed, they saw most of their family members killed in front of their eyes, they had diseases, they couldn't walk straight, they were, they were thirsty, they were hungry, they were broken people. And they took these people and they forced them to march in the freezing cold. And anybody who fell down, if you didn't get right back up, you were shot. And so Viktor Frankl... Not you, they. They were shot. And Viktor Frankl um, fell down. And how did he get back up? Because he visualized himself. He pictured to himself how he would be one day teaching in university a new generation of students and telling them about this experience. Wow. So when we're talking about this time of Mashiach, I want you, our listeners, to visualize for yourself. First of all, I want you to close your eyes and picture what it's going to be like when this war is won, when our hostages come home, when the world is like in this space of being totally ready for Mashiach. And yeah. what is that... What is that going to look like? And what is that going to feel like? And, and what are you going to be surrounded with? Like use all your five senses to visualize that. Mm. And that is so powerful. It's also something that um, we've learned as Chabad followers. The idea of think good and it will be good. Mm. And when we envision a positive outcome, then we actually, our thoughts are so powerful and our mindset that that can create that positive reality. That's what right. we've been taught. So that means that the fact that your question is coming in and you're looking at this time, not as like, oh my gosh, there's so much fighting, the world is falling apart. If anything, you are in that space where you're holding on to that faith and you're saying to yourself, wait, hold on, like I'm, I'm just ready. Like let Mashiach come already. Why we're is he already. not here? And we're all asking the same question. Mm. And the Rebbe also told us, like, don't just say to Hashem, oh, okay, Mashiach's not here. No, like, we have to storm the heavens. And that's what the whole world is doing right now, is saying to God, please end this war. Like, bring back the hostages, end the war. And 
we need to eradicate, we, Hashem needs to help us eradicate evil so that this never happens again. And once Mashiach comes, evil will not exist. Right. So we are all waiting for that time. And I just want to end off that also what we learn is that God wants this world to be a comfortable place for him and for us because we all have a part of him inside of us like our, our godly soul. So that means that everything that's happening right now, all the good deeds, all the unity, people doing good things for each other and listening to Hashem and following in His ways, that we're all bringing that reality here. And you're asking, how do we know He's coming? Or He could have come. So either Mashiach's going to come where the whole, it's going to be like all of a sudden like miracles and whoa, like the whole world is going to change. Or the other way that Mashiach is going to come is that it's going to transition from what we're used to slowly into a time of utopia. And if we look around us, it's happening. He is actually, like he or, or the time of utopia, the time of Mashiach is happening because if you look around and you see two soldiers who are on opposite sides of the political parties, you know, with their hands around each other and right. they're just fighting together and and this unity and people are taking on good deeds and looking not fighting at, with each other they're fighting Hamas together yes thank you a common enemy <laughs> yeah. so it's it is happening but we're not seeing it as like oh my gosh Mashiach's mm. here but think about it that it's happening and every good action that you do every good thought that you have every right. good intention is getting us closer to that time right so Let's go right into our next question. The question was, ever since the war started, I have a strong desire to join the army. Is it worth spending three years of my life? So, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so, first of all, you've already joined the army. That's what I wanna say. When I went to teach my elementary students, um, some of them said, I just want a gun and I just want to go fight. That was their response. Mm. And so I brought them a video where um, the idea that the soldiers are doing their job of being in the army and fighting physical, you know, with the, with the weapons and the shields. And we are fighting this war through learning Tyra or through doing good things. So again, these questions are anonymous. I don't know what what you are doing but i'm sure you're doing really good things already and the fact that you want to join the army shows how much you care about you Your know fellow Jews. yes you care about um this war and i just want to share one thing so we were in israel for a wedding back in june and there was somebody who was speaking with my brother one of my older brothers and he was saying like he was like not religious and he was saying yeah you know what it's so upsetting that the non-religious, they're fighting for the war, they're protecting this country, they're doing what they need to do. And all the religious men, they just get time off, you know, they just sit comfortably in a room with, you know, and they are learning all day. And so my brother came back, we were staying in an Airbnb and he brought this up. And one of my sisters-in-law said something so brilliant. She said, she said, they are also fighting the war, these religious men. Because what we need, and if you think of the tribes, the Shvatim, there was Yisachar and Zvulun they were a partnership because right. one of them was the one that was going out to business and making money and while the other one was learning Tyra. So they were like in a partnership. You needed both. Right. So she was saying that the, the, the country is protected and all of, all of the Jews are protected with the learning of the Tyra. We need both. And that's how Jews fight. If you look back, if you look back at Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, like when he was fighting Esav, he prepared for war with three preparations. One of them was preparing for war physically, like the, like the army is doing. The other one was preparing gifts. And then the third way, which was what we have, was davening, was praying, learning Tyra. That is literally protecting all the Jews. So I just want to say that you're already in the army, whether or not you call it the army of Hashem or the army of, you know, Jews, but you're, you're doing good work whether or not you're actually physically in the army. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember, just add to what Bashi's saying, that it's a war effort. So, you know, the same way that to support the soldiers fighting, 
we need to listen to what they're asking for. And they're asking for Yidin to do Yiddish things. Yeah. That's what they're asking for, Jews to be Jewish and to, and to be proud Jews. Um, the other piece is that, uh, just on a very practical level, the reserves in Israel are so full that people are being sent away. Our, our brother-in-law was sent back home. He went to join up and he was sent back home because they have too many people. Yeah. So they don't need soldiers to join the army right now. Um, everybody participates in their own way. You know, I, I am a therapist and I signed up to provide therapy for soldiers and for um, people affected by the war. Yeah. Um, you know, people who are uh, affected in a way that they cannot function emotionally and someone else can help them in that way to, so that that psychological warfare doesn't affect them as much, they do that. Yeah. Everybody joins the war effort in their way. Yeah, and, and we can't, you know, sitting here, we don't know your, um, where you're coming from or even what your parents feel about this question. So it's not really... Are, um, we can't really tell you, you know, yes, go join the army and mm. it's worth spending three years of your life. But if this is like a serious consideration that you have and you feel like this is how you want to give back, I would suggest that you sit down with your parents and have a conversation with them, see their reaction, see what they feel. And also consider what are you already doing in your life that if you were to enlist and you were to, you know, even be on standby <laughs> for reserves, is that even an option in your life? Or what, like we said, what you're doing already to help combat this war, that might be enough too. Mm. And um, so I think, you know, speak to your mentors, speak to your parents. And if this is a serious consideration, but sit down with, you know, people who care for you and people who are in your life who can help you make this big decision. Right. Yeah. Okay. So next question. I have a friend who is trying to distance herself from me because I'm too skinny and pretty and I'm going to give her an eating disorder and it really hurts me to lose my best friend. What do I do? Yeah, so this is tough because um, I think that um, when, first of all, I think teenagers, it's, it's tough to be a teenager. It's one of the most difficult times of our lives. You're discovering yourself and you're finding out who you are and, um, you know, when, when, we're, when we're a teenager and we're trying to figure out what's going on, many times there is this, um, we compare what we're going through on the inside to the way that people appear on the outside. And when you compare your insides, everyone else's outsides, that's a recipe for being really sad and being... Um, uh, upset yeah and the other thing I wanted to bring up uh, but go ahead Rush. Oh, that's good the other thing I wanted to bring up is that I don't know that people can give someone else an eating disorder mm. I don't know that you can take that much responsibility for someone else's behavior yeah um, and but I, I feel like there's a dynamic in the relationship here there's something happening between you two that's behind these feelings mm. In other words, if the relationship is a best friend relationship, then it should, in theory, be stronger than looks hmm. and appearances That's and, and what someone else thinks about the way that you look. And if it's based only on looks and appearances, then maybe revisit the friendship. Yeah. And a best friend, I always think of this. Someone told it to me once. A best friend, you know it's a good friend if you feel closer to yourself when you spend time together. Like she makes, like you feel good about yourself mm. after you spend time together. If you're with a friend who makes you feel further away from yourself, like you're putting yourself down or you're doubting yourself after spending time with them, that's not really a good friend. A good friend, you know, should be able to appreciate us and be able mm. to value and to be able to, um, it doesn't sound like the healthiest. And again, we don't know, you know, who you are or what relationship you're in, but on our end, I'm, I'm just like echoing what Shua said. It doesn't sound like such a healthy dynamic when one friend is either jealous of or intimidated by something that you can't change. If you're, right. you know, you're not writing that you do have an eating disorder. Hashem, Hashem creates everybody with different um, body 
with types and sizes. Exactly. And it's, it's if it's not something you could change and this is something that she's intimidated by, then maybe she needs a little bit more time to decide for herself is this mm. is this a type of friendship that I can handle mm. given like given the fact that, you know, this is my friend who can't change the way she's been created or her metabolism. Right. And so but if she, if she's constantly afraid of you giving her something, it doesn't sound like a positive um, relationship. On on at least from what I'm hearing. Yeah. But if I can share a little bit of a personal experience sure. with eating disorders, um, when I was in grade nine, I was um, very very thin, but not healthy. Um, I basically developed an eating disorder, which really stemmed from depression undiagnosed depression and anxiety and it was a way eating disorders is a way of taking control and so I really finally found a way for that people would pay attention to me people would comment you know people compliment when you lose weight all of a sudden I was getting attention I had a very low self-confidence up until then and and having an eating disorder didn't change that but I do want to say that thank god my mom intervened and I was able to get back on track and I went to an eating disorders clinic um and a good friend of mine in my friend group, she saw how much weight I had lost and she actually started trying to copy me. And I actually told her because I had just gone through it. I remember going like saying, hey, let's go out together. And I remember, I don't know, we took a walk or I sat mm. with her and I was like, you know, 15 years old. And I said to her, please don't go down this route. I just went through it and I actually had lost my menstrual period for a year, which was very scary because I wasn't sure if I would ever have children. So that's what really motivated me to not go down that road. But because I had been down that road, I was able to tell my friend, please don't do it. And she didn't. I was able to stop her. But that, that scenario was something I had been through. And yes, my friend was starting to copy me. And so I was able to guide her kind of and say to her as a friend I'm really like don't do it I wonder though because the person who's writing says I'm too skinny and pretty yeah it sounds like the person who's writing the question is associating skinny with pretty and I wonder if you have an eating disorder and that's why um, you are feeling skinny and pretty and that that's what the person's afraid of you giving it to them, giving them an eating disorder because you actually have one. Hmm. So if so, you do, I think Bashi's experience is very appropriate for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, there's background noise. Um, we'll, we'll move closer to the mic. We don't stop for anything, guys. You know that already. So to definitely, definitely... Um, Get the help you need. Yes. Eating disorders clinic. And then if you are going through an eating disorder to speak to your friend, or the other piece was, and say, don't make the same mistakes that I'm making. 